Ladies and gents, boys and girls, welcome to the Ace K Baker Show. Today we got Dre Evans in the house. Thank you for being here, my brother. Really no, appreciate no you. Um, before I even jump in and give you a full background on Dre, I'll just overarchingly say he's done a lot in his life, in his current stage. He is um, a real estate investor and partners up with other people. But leading up to that is really a very fascinating story. So I let uh, Dre introduce himself and I'll let him give you a little bit on his background and I'll just chime in with a couple of questions here and there. Yeah, just a kid from Chicago, originally mm -hmm. from there on the south side. And, you know, my biological father was a drug addict. I'm a triplet and my mom has four uncles, four brothers rather, they're all drug addicts. Right. So grew up in, the, in not the best situation. I think that after going through that for some time, I'm seeing what's around me, I decided to join a gang on the south side of Chicago at the age of 12. And that was from a mix of things, right? It was for protection purposes, but also because I just, you, you cannot dream what you cannot see. You mm. see these people, you see the guys with the cars and the women and of course. the flashiness, you, and you're looking up to them, you're like, I want to be that. And I think that that pushes you to become in that lifestyle. I did that for a few years and until I had the opportunity of a lifetime to get out and I took that golden ticket and I didn't look back. How did the, couple of things actually, one I want to ask you how that opportunity manifested itself um, one, but I also for the people who may not know anything about the south side of Chicago, because we have people tuning in from all around the world. What would you say the south side of Chicago was like, or what you know, what is it today? What was it then? Like, what, what, what is it, right? It's a little. It's the same today as it was when I was going up through mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. Imagine a city where you're always watching your back. Mm -hmm. You know, the drive-by shootings, the gun violence, the, the robbings, the killings, um, just poverty, you know what I mean? Right. You know, you're driving through a city and most of the homes are boarded up and that's normal. It's right. normal to see people driving down the street bumping hip-hop music, speakers so loud in the trunk that the car is shaking, the house is shaking. Right. It's normal to you know, see a city that almost has like a cloud of gray over it. Right. And it's weird, right? Because we live in sunny San Diego and we just see, it looks so vibrant, it looks sure. so lively. Yeah. But on the south side of Chicago, it's the exact opposite of that. Like you drive down the street and it feels dark. Gloomy. It feels yeah. gloomy, it feels mysterious. And even on a, on a hot summer day, it still feels eerie. Wow. You know what I mean? That's a trip. Yeah. Interesting. But it's the same mecca, it's the same patterns and things you would see in the hood of Baltimore. Right. Or the hood of Detroit. I can see that. Yeah. So then came an opportunity and you latched on to that, right? Why do you think, one, you had this space, the, the mindset for it to grab this opportunity and maybe like take your life in a different direction? How did it present itself? I think that. You know, just like anything in life, we all have one second to take a knee, take a breath and figure out where we want to go in life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that one second decision to takes and can change your life forever. Sure. And in my case, I could have taken the mindset that what was me, look at all this stuff that I'm going through in Chicago, the violence, uh, the racism, I can't get out, I'm a product of my environment, it's rigged against me, it is what it is. But I don't know, man, I just took the opposite, opposite response where I kept looking at like everything with my family, my circumstance, everything around me, I was like, I wanna be better. Right. And I can be better. I'm like, what if? Right. Like, what, what if, if I if? make it out? Mm -hmm. What if I am better? Right. You know, instead of like, and what if I do punch through? And I think that because I asked that question, that's what allowed me to have the mindset to get out. And so there was a man that was considered an enemy, of my, my enemy at the time. He was my stepdad. Sure. Uh, because he did a lot of physical and emotional abuse to my mom. Mm -hmm. And he had mentioned West Point, the Naval Academy, the Air Force Academy. Okay. And it was him mentioning that, which kind of planted that seed of like that, that opportunity for me to go to the Naval Academy. So it put it on your horizon and you then started doing research or whatever you needed to do to figure out a way in he was prior so he did army for four years mm. and i'm assuming at that time in that period his officer who was the superior was a west point graduate 
That's what it's saying. And that's how he found out about the service academies like West Point, like the Neo Academy, like the And West Academy. Point, really, for all intents and purposes, is one of the most renowned academies, it right? Is. Yeah, West Point, Na- and West it's Point, and competitive Na- to get yeah. in. Like, I don't know this, and probably a lot of people mm-hmm. watching don't know that either, but it's probably very competitive to get in. Yeah, as well, very right? competitive. And so, him mentioning that shed a light on that, but he, and we were like, no, we, we, we didn't realize what it was. We didn't realize what any of the service academies were. Right. And that they were more like, they were like Ivy League leadership institutions that they were hard to get into. We right. just thought armed forces go to Middle East, bang, bang, shoot them up, especially with the war in Middle East at the time. And we just kept throwing it off, throwing it off. Even my mom like, no, nah, we're good. Nobody in our, in our family was in the, in the service either. Sure. But he kept, for whatever reason, like even with the stuff that he had going on, for whatever reason, he kept bringing it up, which that part was makes it weird looking back. And so, and we ended up like, saying fine we'll we'll look into this we drove an hour out to the suburbs of Mm -hmm. chicago and i I remember i met uh, a gentleman he was the first man i met that had a master's degree oh wow his dude his name was colonel banks he had a phd and five master's degrees yes okay and well educated well educated so it was my first time seeing a man in that light in a positive light sure was he a brother as well or he was a brother as well and we got to meet some of the other cadets that were at West Point. They debunked all the myths that we had about the military and whatnot. And from there, I think he could see that like a light bulb went out and we these kids from Chicago, me and my trooper brothers, and he, in this, at this information session, he's like, you know what? We'll pay for you guys to go to New York for a week and you can experience it. And that was my first time out of Chicago. And I remember going and just feeling safe, mm-hmm. feeling like I didn't have to worry about anything. Yeah. People wanted my best interest at heart. How old were you then? 18? At that point, I was junior in high school. Yeah, so Just, set, so set, 17, 17, 18. 18. So that's the first time in your life when you felt safe? Yes. And then from there, wow. when I came back, there was a drive-by shooting on me and my best friend. And that was kind of the final wake-up call. I was like, I'm done, I gotta get out. I'm done with this gang shit. Yeah. And then I confronted the gang to get out. Wow, that's wild. How interesting, and how well. Tony Tony Robbins says, uh, "Luck is labor under controlled knowledge." Right? I don't know how much controlled knowledge you had when you were seventeen, but you must have had the desire to change something, and I think that's very admirable. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and then now you're in. So tell us what happened next. Uh, wasn't smart enough to get into the Naval Academy. So we didn't go to West Point. We chose the Naval Academy. Me and my brothers pretty much put up a dry erase board. We mapped out the difference between the Naval Academy and West Point. Right. Which is Army. And we chose Naval Academy, went there. Well, I went to the prep school, which is in Newport, Rhode Island, because I didn't have the academics or the test scores to get into the Naval Academy directly. Okay. So I go to this prep school. I swore in the Navy, wore the uniform, did the whole nine. I was enlisted. But I'm basically in this prep school that's supposed to teach me to be a better student. And even in that and getting coaching and everything every single day, the minimum GPA was 2.2 I had to maintain. And I literally barely made that. Okay. So that first year I struggled. Sure, that makes sense. In that prep school. But as you were saying, like when we went on our walk today, you said you didn't have the tools initially to be a good student because you were just, you you just never focused on school. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know how to study. I, I was I was intimidated by math. I always did, did bad at math. And then I, after I made it through the prep school, I then went. I had, Because I was able to pass the prep school, that was my ticket to the Naval Academy. Mm-hmm. So then I go into the Naval Academy, four-year institution, leadership laboratory, and then I go into what's called plebe year. And somehow, some way, that year, I just figured it out. And oh, wow. so okay. when I went into the Naval Academy that four years, I, I hauled ass. And I married you to engineering, graduated the top of my class, and, and figured it out. That's what's up. Yeah. That's cool. So now you, you've graduated and you start working, right? Mm-hmm. And this is all now in the framework under the umbrella of the Navy. Mm-hmm. You start doing work. What? I mean, tell us what time, share what, w- with us what you can about those times and how they that kind of brought you to the present times um, well I me- when I me- immediately graduated I worked at the Pentagon basically doing drone re- underwater drones 
research. Mm. And then I went from there and then I was a submarine officer, went through nuclear training. It was cool, I, I, I liked that part, but I realized like this is a hard life and I didn't want that sustainably. And when you say it's a hard life, give us an example of just, what that was. Just the training and that you're constantly on the microscope with your certification and everything because you're right. a nuclear trained submarine officer. And, I, and there's a lot of people that get out from that. Right. And I'm thinking that they're fresh out, I'm like, man, I don't know if I want to do this for a sustainable period of time. And so for me, I switched to be a supply corps officer, which is basically logistics, business management, accounting, finance, operational logistics for the Navy. Uh, all the money, all the parts, all the goods, services, everything. Right. Switched to become a supply corps officer. And from there, I was, that eventually brought me out here to San Diego. Hmm. Get my time. And then I got started in the real estate when I was getting coffee with another Naval County brother who was also a supply car officer. And I'm thinking to him about how until I published my first book, I had a two year lead time until that first book came out with the publisher that I wanted to get my mom out of the hood, out of Chicago. And right. I, like, I don't know how to do that because the Navy's not it. Right. And that's when he said the words to me, multi-family. Multi-family. 